Hey guys, Buckeye Bar guys. Uh, we wanted to thank you guys for uh, tuning in to us here on uh, Buckeye Bar Talk. Uh, great show we got coming up today. Uh, we're really looking forward to you guys uh, listening and watching it. Um, but just wanted to remind everybody, just uh, remember to subscribe to the channel, hit the all notifications bell, uh, and to, so that way anytime uh, a new show comes up, you guys will uh, be alerted to it. And don't forget to like the video and uh, comment on the video. All interactions with us uh, helps us continue to grow, and uh, we appreciate your support. Now to the show. Welcome back, everybody, to Buckeye Bar Guys here on Buckeye Bar Talk. I'm Mike. And I'm John. Tonight, uh, day, today's date is uh, Saturday, uh, January 8th, uh, 2022, so Happy New Year for everybody. This is the first show of the new year. Uh, yeah, we so, haven't done uh, 22 yet. Yeah, so, um, like so a lot of stuff to go over, uh, but uh, is, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the Rose Bowl. We know it's been, uh, it's been, it seems like that was a while ago, that crazy it's been one week. It's only yeah. been one week. I know. Uh, that uh crazy crazy game that is but uh we haven't got to share our thoughts on that uh then we're gonna talk a little bit about coaching uh the some uh moves this week in the, the coaching staff and uh then we will uh talk about some recruits we've gotten uh three commitments uh since uh last time we talked and um then we'll just kind of finish up on just our general thoughts of the year how everything went and uh Send 2021 off, I guess, uh, to uh, as uh, we start now getting ready to think about 2022. Only one more college football game to go. And uh, I don't even care about the spread. Alabama is going to win that game. Yeah, seems like nobody's. T- I mean, maybe in SEC country it's talking about it. I mean, I follow a lot of people. It really doesn't seem like anybody's talking about this game. So I don't really know what ratings are going to be like. I, I have a feeling this is going to be probably a a pretty badly rated game. Uh, I just, I don't think there's, it just uh, seems like there's absolutely zero buzz for this game right now. And of course that could be Northern Ohio person in me, uh, the bias of Ohio state. It just, it seems like, and you know, a bunch of people in Columbus will still watch it. And uh, the college territories around the country, this, that's what always happens. So I'm sure it'll do okay in Columbus and stuff, but I mean, I'll tune in every now and then, but I'm not going to, I'm not sitting down to like hardcore watch the game. I don't think, um, unless like there's absolutely nothing else to do. Um, so who who knows? Agree with that. All right. Rose bowl. So, um, wow, that was a crazy game. Uh, (laughs) yeah, man, I have not had a game that I'm trying to think of as a Buckeye fan that just have went from, there's been different roller coaster emotions with other games before. There's, you know, I mean, I'll tell think. you the one. It's twenty. It's the 2015 Sugar Bowl is what that was like. <laughs> that they they jumped out on top of us, but we were getting yards. And it was like at some point, you know, we could score and we could take control of this game, but it just wasn't happening. And that, seemed, that's what even, that game reminded me. Even of. the even that game. So 2015 Sugar Bowl. I didn't want to get embarrassed by Alabama in the first playoff, but you know, Cardell's the starter, you know, like I, I felt like we were playing with uh, house money to begin with, uh, you know, so I mean, we, we all watched watch that game together. I mean, Ohio state was making some mistakes and stuff like that, but, and they weren't scoring touchdowns and Alabama was, and I'm just like, Obviously, I didn't want to get blown out, but I'm just like, there was a point in that game. I like, I don't think I was like upset necessarily that they were getting their butts handed to them. Like, and the way I was, it was weird for as much as I've said, you know, the Rose Bowl anymore, this is an expedition game. I was pretty pissed off in the, the first half of that game because yeah. I'm just like, especially the, the way the game started off. I mean, they have two straight three and outs, Utah. You know, they don't score on their first possession, but on the next two possessions, they do score. They're up 14 to nothing. It's like, um, okay, they're going to get, we're going to get blown out by Utah. And, you know, we said that before the game that you you can't, for Ohio State fans or that are just thinking, this is just Utah. Like, if you come, if they come in with that type of mindset, uh, Utah is going to hand it to them. And that's for, it looked like that's what was happening. Like, it felt like it was going to be one of those, uh, if Utah took the foot off the pedal in the second half type games, you know, maybe we'll lose like uh, 45 to uh, 
you know, 21. That's what that game f- was starting to feel like. And, you know, so second half, completely different emotion. So I don't think I've had a, I don't think I've ever had a Buckeye game that I can think of where I've really had, like, went from, like, complete anger to, like, okay, they're doing something, like, you know, third quarter, okay, yeah, let's see what we can do. And then, like, fourth quarter, like, really, really into the game that it's, like, you know, you know, all the momentum and everything's on their side. And, you know, it was just just kind of a just crazy emotional, not even going to say roller coaster because there wasn't a lot of ups and downs. It was just, like, pure down, like Grand Canyon down, and then, like, going to the moon up. So <laughs> I hear that. <laughs> So, like, I mean, your thoughts, I mean. Oh, absolutely the same. I mean, the first half, Ohio State, they got to figure out next year, you know, how to be more effective running the ball. I mean, we can talk about, you know, defensive struggles, whatever. I'm sure we will here in the next couple minutes. But they got, like, you cannot waste Trevion Henderson. Yeah, I know. You got to figure out what you got to do as a line schematically what types of plays he needs, but you cannot waste that talent. So, and Mayan Williams, I mean, like it's gotten to the point this year that I almost feel like Mayan Williams, like it was like the right call that he should be the starter at, you know, at the end that Mayan just takes his stuff head on. And it's like Trevion just under this system, he tries to bounce everything out and it's not there. It's there to wrap him up. Even though he was, I mean, he was starting to get some nice yards in the second half. It was just he started. Uh, he started finding his holes in the line. He started kind of yeah. engaging and running, you know, full force at the line, and he wasn't trying to bounce everything. So I mean, yeah. he he was improving, and I think when they took him out, I mean, there because there was a couple series in a row that mine was in. So I think they might have took Trevion out and had a hard conversation with them, like, hey, you know, if you're not going to help us out, mine's a you know, mine runs upfield. Yeah. We're going to need him to be in there. I think, um, and for anything else, just getting the running game going, I mean, that probably stops a couple of those three and outs, and maybe, you know, you can settle into that game a little easier to start off a game. I mean, so, yeah. um, but, I mean, those are not the stories of the game. So the stories of the game is definitely, and it's almost like it's weird. Like, it's kind of like Stroud takes a kind of a backseat, even though he's the guy throwing the ball <laughs> to him that, uh, you know, I mean, JSN, I mean, just had a, just an outrageous game. And Stroud had an outrageous game, too. I mean, some of the throws he made, I mean, he hits Marvin Harrison. And, I mean, he hits three unbelievable throws over our shoulders. And, like, you know, he hits a Muka on, on the sidelines. He hit Harrison for a touchdown. And then he hits JSN for a touchdown all over the shoulder. That Great just touchdown. That are nuts. And, yeah. And. I mean, obviously, Ryan Day approves of that t- last touchdown. <laughs> As anybody who's seen the he and caught it, yeah, them was... slowing it down so he could read his lips. But uh, yeah, check that out if you haven't checked it out. But so, I mean, and and Smith and Jigba almost scored another touchdown. Yeah. Clark Phillips, who at one point was a commit to Ohio State, had the game of his life. Well, I'm, I don't know, maybe not the game of his life because he did get burned quite a bit. <laughs> He did have a couple bad looks out there, but he had a great interception. Yeah, I mean, it was a bad throw, but it was a good interception, and he made that a hell of a play on Smith yeah. and Jigba to stop Ohio State from scoring. And yeah, uh, yeah. those were like, we were starting to eat up yards. I mean, Smith and Jigba, like you said, he was the man of the hour. I mean, he had, what, like two 50-yard touchdowns on back-to-back plays, but... Yeah. And almost the next one, I think, was almost the next play after that or something like that. It was close. And I was just like, he had that fumble. So we never got it closer, you know, than two scores from there. And then the opening drive of the second half, that's when Stroud throws the interception. I'm like, my God, like, you know, we're figuring out, but we're just, I don't know. We're not getting closer to two, them two touchdowns. I just don't know what's going to happen. And then, especially then, because our defense struggled so much in the first half, it's like, crap you know are these guys gonna go down make this a three score game can we come yeah. back three score game at that point so i think that's like actually the one thing that got lost a lot in the shuffle of the game is that just how impressive the defense ended up being in the second half and you know like i mean i definitely want to shout out 
to them because they were got off on the first half. <laughs> like, you know, like I, was, you know, I cannot wait until a new concept is in there and we are no longer guarding get grass yeah. in a in a zone look. Like that is just their pass coverage in the middle of the field with their linebackers is just frigging like abysmal. And I just cannot wait till that gets worked on. Yeah. I agree. And so, yeah, so definitely uh, JSN and uh, Stroud. I mean, CJ Stroud, man, it was like, uh, I mean, he, it was like he, uh, you know, people could say, I, I know he took a little uh, crap from, uh, you know, it was cold up there uh, against the Michigan game. But I think he, uh, I think he took that in the fourth place finish. I mean, he even said it, that, you know, he took that, uh, kind of took those personal that, uh, you know, that, that stuff happened. And, uh, I mean, he was a hell of a player all year and we'll get that out here in the second half of this uh, show. But, uh, he's, he was like, I mean, he was just like cold, the ice cold, like just how nasty he was that whole game. Once he, once he got going and it was just like, well, I'm putting this all on my shoulders and I'm going to go out and, you know, if we don't ever get closer to the two touchdowns, well, you, you know, you can blame the defense all you want on that one, but I'm going to put up my numbers and uh, it's like, we're going to score a, a bunch of points and we'll see if Utah can keep that up. But uh, right. you know, they couldn't. Uh, so, I mean, it was hell of a game from Utah. I mean, they definitely, uh, they were their, the, their Super Bowl. It was their they, national title game. They had the fans behind them and uh, they, uh, they looked real tough there that first half. And I was just like, you know, I, I know we said that before that game is, you know, don't be, you know, if you don't come in ready to play Utah, you know, Utah can blow you out if you're not ready for it. And it's like, but even I'm like, I'm like, like if they get blown out by freaking Utah, like <laughs> almost happened. Yeah. So eh, glad that, uh, I'm glad they came back. I'm glad they won. They f- finished the season on at least a uh, positive note there. Not, I know not necessarily anywhere near where they wanted to be, but, uh, you know, it's good to win a tough one out after you, especially you lose that tough one to Michigan and you can never get it back into within one score that whole second half that, you know, that the defense just completely is letting them run you them over the whole second half. And, you know, the offense actually did good against pretty good in the second half against Michigan for the most part. It's just could never get back to that within that one score. And then they finally started pulling away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. And so it, it does feel good. Um, of course, you know, Stroud had a good game against Michigan. You already said that. What I was so impressed with, though, because, you know, a lot of people all year long with Wilson and Olave, and I, 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 it did die down as the year went on. But a lot of people early in the year, you know, they said how much of those receivers were actually making Stroud look better that, you know, yards after catch, whatever it was. I mean, this game, this was kind of like a perfect balance between the two that Smith and Jigba, you know, he did a lot after catching the ball. But there were a lot of throws that the reason he could do so much is because where they wore, or as you mentioned, those over the shoulder throws were only those receivers could catch the ball. Yeah, they ran great routes, but the the throws were everything that, you know, made. Well, I mean, I think I think four of the touchdowns are just pure passing touchdowns, aren't they? I mean, they they're in the end zone, aren't they? Like um two to Harrison. One, one to JSN, I know for sure. Jigba. Well, it would be three to Harrison, right? All three of his are in the end zone, aren't they? Okay, so yeah, so yeah, so there's yeah. four. So, I mean, those were all good throws. I mean, but so. even even on top of that, I mean, do you remember that play where Smith and Jigba's lined up in the backfield? Yeah. Like that, I mean, I don't even remember. Was that one of the touchdowns? That went really far. I know that, but I mean, that pass was beautiful. I mean, Stroud threw that ball when he was almost like even with the defender and he threw it in between three people and Smith and Jigba caught and was able, you know, to make yeah. plays on it. So yeah, yeah it, was, it was a beautiful, you know, kind of just compliment of what we had seen all year between Stroud being able to place the ball better than most that I've seen ever. And, you know, Smith and Jigba being able to make plays after the catch. Um, I don't want to forget to talk about Tommy Eichenberg Court yeah. Williams, my God, even Cade Stover, like those guys played tough as hell in the second half and they made some plays. So, I mean, 
I know they're going to be a little short on tight end next year, but I mean, Cade needs to be on defense. I mean, I think that's kind of obvious that I think he's just, that's his natural positions defense. And with, uh, you know, with a new, uh, with Knowles coming in, I think he could use all the defense help as he can get, you know, because it's, now it's time to see who's uh, ready to play high real football next year on this side of the ball. And, you know, I'm a, you and I'm I, ex- we talk a lot about projects at Ohio as far as like linemen, like that they don't need to be five stars ready to play when they come in. Do you kind of feel that way about tight end as well? Like, I know like how your passing offense is, but you don't use the tight ends that much anyways. Like, do you really need a Jeremy Rucker moving forward? Can't you get a couple like three star guys so you can stock that room back up? And then maybe then once you have numbers, you can focus on maybe getting like a four star tight end or something like that. Maybe I would like to see maybe if they can maybe try to develop a couple. Oh, uh, so maybe, uh, um, I would like to see where, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I get what you're saying too. It's just like, like I, I like them to find good people, but I just wish they would use them more. Like they, and I get you got, there is so, no shortage in the Midwest United States of decent tight ends. Like if you're going to, you know, if you're not going to use them at the point, then like maybe you should just uh, focus, you know, keep guys like Kate Stover on defense. And uh, you know, because I mean, I mean, I with, guess, what did Kate Stover do that he couldn't have played defense this year and it could have just been Rucker Mitch Rossi, you know? And I know you yeah. don't have numbers over there and it sucks, but I don't, that's just like, that's where I'm at this year is, and I know, I'm sure Kate did a lot in the run game that I'm not giving him credit for, but I just always thought, I mean, the guy was Mr. Ohio mainly for, you know, defense. Like he came out of high school for defense. Like he should have been a defensive player, whether. Um, because of his size, I mean, they talked about him moving down and going into the Rushman room, you know, working with LJ as an end or staying as a linebacker, either one. But I mean, think about if that guy, if he got the reps all year and he was one of your linebackers, I, I don't know if anything's different against Michigan or not, but I mean, he he's brought, a, he brought an edge about that defense. Yeah. He's you know, a bigger he body. Gotta, he might be able to be more physical there against Michigan. Um, so yeah, I would like to see him stay. Um, um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, yeah, Eichenberg, I was very impressed with in the second half. Same with Court Williams. I'm really looking forward to what uh, what Knowles can do with those guys. Uh, you know, he's got, he's got to find a way to get Court on the field. Yeah, I mean that guy's I, too good of a tackler in space. He has to be on the field. Like I'm, I think I'm ready. I I think that. They should probably, you know, as long as he has a good spring and stuff, he should probably be one of those three starting safeties and kind of be the the linebacker version of the, you know, that that more of a, you know, they he uses three safeties, but one of them tends to be a little bit bigger of a body, so it's kind of like that third linebacker and probably should be court and you know, and then you got Hickman and you know, be, and then between uh, you know, Proctor and uh, the the new guy they got in from Oklahoma State, Tanner, and they. And then they got the really good, uh, they got that good freshman class last year that, so, I mean, I think they'll end up being fine in safeties. It's just, uh, you know, we'll see that, uh, you know, that court Williams needs to be playing more. And, uh, I mean, that's, that's the type of guy I, I don't want to turn around at the end of this spring and see that he's transferred to USC or something crazy like that because he couldn't get on the field. Yeah. All right. Anything else you want to hit on the Rose bowl? I mean, I was just impressed that you were able to come back. No, yeah. I, think, I think we're good. I was, ha- you know, obviously happy with the game. Um, Ryan Day had a terrible management of the clock at the very end of it, which I think he was just, I think he was really confused why Whittingham didn't use timeouts to try to get the ball back. And he kind of freaked and he called that timeout and like, was the time a, was the yeah. clock still, was the clock still bad on the field or something? Like, was it still messed up? Like, cause we were, we're talking about it here like me and uh you know when like we were just like we were trying to figure it out like are they uh is the clock like because i know the clock was off for part of the game on the field i'm mean, like was that was it not working like was that something i mean 
I don't think anybody asked necessarily just because it didn't matter at the end yeah. of it, but it was like, <laughs> like, yeah. They're not taking a, any time, and I'm just like, just run this clock down to whatever, two seconds, and I mean, kick the field goal. And then to not even, like, squib it <laughs> with 10 seconds left or 9 seconds left, whatever it was, I was just like, man, they're just trying to give me a heart attack right now. Like, the guy, j- the guy's already returned one on you. I think they were running a, a, I mean, a, yes, I would have preferred a squib. I think they were running, a, like, a very wide kickoff formation. I don't think they were running their typical kickoff formation. I think they were trying to... Uh, where he could he could bust it out somewhere. I think they were just trying to keep everybody in front of him. But yeah, I would have preferred the squib kick. And uh, hell, I would have preferred just like an onside kick, so they would have had to recover, blow one second. Maybe off the- maybe oh. in some weird way, he maybe they thought if they did the squib kick, it if it doesn't get all the way to the back, uh, it offers more opportunities for uh, la- for la- uh, laterals and stuff like that. And they, you know, maybe somebody gets loose, so kick it to the back where nobody's behind him, even though he tried, somebody has did try to run behind him. But, you know, at that point I wasn't really afraid of anybody else on it. Maybe they were afraid if somebody lateraling it to him. And since he was so shifty that, that little future new England Patriots, uh, (laughs) wide receiver, like Bill Belichick was probably salivating when, uh, it's like, my God is my next Will Smoker. And, uh, (laughs) right. I got my my next Brady, which, you know, We all don't know about Mac Jones yet or not, but yeah, he's just, he's waiting for his next, next Wes Welker to prolong his yeah. career. But all right. No, I'm good after that. It was a, it was a fun game to watch. Yeah. All right. So coaches, so we know Knowles is coming in a couple changes over the last couple. So studs out Barnes is out uh, right now. Knowles has replaced Bar is Barnes. So they're full there. There's some rumors, you know, there might be a couple more moves over there, but, uh, nothing as of now. Um, so I mean, I would still, we've talked about this in the past. I would like them to move. Uh, I would like to move them moving Parker, uh, demoting him or whatever. And, uh, to get another defensive coach and, you know, maybe let them let one of the, Defensive coaches, Combs or whoever, be the special teams coach, and then just let Parker run it. And I don't even let care if they let Parker keep his. I mean, I'm. You don't even have to demote him on his salary. Whatever they're paying him, maybe even give him a raise a little bit. If uh, they like him, they like him. They're Ohio State. They can afford it. Um, <clears throat> so you know, I mean, whatever. Um, but I would like one more de- higher defensive coach. That way, they had five offensive coaches, five defensive coaches, and Ryan Day is the head coach. That, yeah. you know, that that makes the complete sense to me. And I would like to see that's where it goes. Um, so stud offensive side of the ball studs out. Um, I mean, kind of the writing was on the roll. I mean, everybody knew his back problems were really getting in the way of him really recruiting. I don't think it was uh, <clears throat> any enjoyment to it anymore for him. So it's uh, it was understandable how that went. Um, yeah. It seems like that they've circled in on uh, Fry, the offensive line coach from UCLA. Um, nothing official yet, but it's you know there's a lot of rumors and uh, sources uh, and the insiders have said that it's you know somewhat of a done deal. It's just not official. officially official. So um, it sounds like he'll be the offensive line coach and run game coordinator, um, which you know. Any new minds in there about running the ball? I, I liked how UCLA ran the ball this year from what I watched of them. Granted, a lot of what I watched of them was early in the season. I watched them against LSU. Um, you know, some of those early games where I'm like, you know, I, I like how they're running the ball. And Chip Kelly kind of reinvented himself. To, he was much more of a kind of a power running team this year than they, you know, ever were at Oregon. And uh, you, so, you know, he kind of reinvented himself a little bit. So, if that would be the higher, I think I would like it. Um, it seems like I read some of the stuff. It seems like he's pretty smart. Um, a lot of passion, different things. You know, I just need the offense line to be a little bit fixed uh, because I'm fine. He, I, I mean, I, I would like if he brings in a couple more run concepts maybe to the the room. But, you know, Coach Alford's a unbelievable running backs coach and just get holes for our running backs. I think uh, Mayan Williams and Trevian Henderson are fine if uh, – you know, you get Lyman that gets some push off the ball. 
Yeah, I mean, we've talked about it before that, and you know, with Ryan Day, I just don't know what it is. I don't. He he does struggle with his run calls when he doesn't have an athletic quarterback, and and that's again not to say that you need a quarterback that runs the ball. I don't want Urban Meyer's offense, but you know, with those stretch runs, it's just like it takes too long to develop, and the backside ends know that they can key in that running back and they get to him because no one is keeping eyes on Stroud on that play, which is yeah. fine that Stroud does not keep that ball. But with that type of motion and how long it takes to develop, that lets a lot of people, you know, start closing in on Henderson yeah. or Williams or wh- whomever. So and if they, w- they got to run better plays, they got to, you know, they got to call better plays and they got to have a better scheme for their line that those guys, you know, are pulling, trapping, whatever it is to bust holes or to create holes. Yeah. The one thing I did like, uh, they did start running, um, just going off of those, just to think about. So you're, you're absolutely right. They need the, the better thing. So I'm hoping that he brings in some different thoughts about that. Um, the one thing I did like is they did start doing more RPO as the season went on that, uh, that was Lee Stroud. That was the the second part of that. If he's not giving it to Henderson, he's doing an RPO. And and going forward, if they're going to run those type of uh, the reads and stuff like that, I hope that's the base of the offense of the reads. If that's what they're going to do, you know, it's an RPO if they're not giving the ball away. And then maybe every little bit, you know, maybe Stroud keeps it to run sure. it. So you know, just to throw that extra wrinkle in, because um, he did do it a couple times this year. Um, but I definitely want to see them. You know, once if this guy does get hired, I would love to see Day and Alfred and him really sit down and be like, you know, and Kevin Wilson, let's get some plays in here that, you know, let's Mayan and Trevian get downhill faster and not have to do so. Because, I mean, Trevian Anderson, I mean, and he'll have another year of, of beef on him that, uh, I mean, that kid gets one seam and he's going to be gone. And, you know, I mean, he doesn't need a lot. And, you know, so, and I'd like to see them work a little bit more on maybe some of the, the passing plays to the running backs that if, you know, just take some of that other stuff out of there that you don't need it right now with Stroud and, uh, you know, maybe have more of a traditional running game with him. I think I read this year, or I think I, I'm pretty sure I read that this year is the first year some studs been there that he hasn't got at least one five-star offensive lineman in the cycle so i mean i don't know it feels like if stud i mean i I know they struggled running the ball and i know he had his misses on recruiting i feel like though if he wanted to be there i think he would have got another chance i honestly do i don't know i i could be wrong everyone's like saying that oh ryan day is making the choice you know the, the hard decisions which i'm i'm here for it like you know i hope he does make hard decisions so maybe he did maybe stud wanted to be back and he said, you don't add, you know, the value that we need right now or we need to go in a different direction. That's quite possible. But yeah. I just I thought that was kind of a staggering thing that, you know, this was the first class that didn't have a five star in it because, you know, that that is a successful recruiting career that yeah. he had. And you think about it, he brought in a lot of four stars, too. I know we had was it 2019 was a day's first year that it was like a bunch of like three star tackles from Ohio, just like project guys, because they needed the depth that they needed, they needed the depth, yeah. like that was, that was a concern for me at the end of that year that he didn't do better throughout that entire cycle that he had to like scramble that much at the end to get all those guys from like, kind of like Mac players, you know, guys that just weren't getting big offers or maybe, yeah. you know, you know what I'm saying that yeah. they, they should have been in much better shape by the time, you know, going into that, the end of that recruiting class and what they wore. And it was just like, he, he took like a bunch of big bodies to make them tackles, but it's like, yeah. why, why did you strike out so much this entire time? And then of course this year was just strikeout after strikeout. That yeah. He I mean, he couldn't close anybody this year. We've talked about this. I don't know how much we've really talked about it here on the podcast, but we've talked about it off the, off the podcast. And I've been a big proponent of it. I know some Buckeye fans probably roll, roll their eyes at a statement like this, but the one like we have in this part of the country, Ohio, 
and even in the greater Midwest and certain pockets is we got a lot of offensive linemen. And like, I, I just think the offensive line recruiting is, they make it a lot harder than it needs to be. And I'm all for going for all the elite kids that you can put in and get offers for, but I would love, you know, there's some big time four star and some even five star kids that come out of the state of Ohio, go get those kids and, you know, build up what your base recruiting, you know, I've, I'm kind of that person that thinks you probably, you need to take four to five offense alignment every class. And so, you know, get your three to four best guys that you can get in here. And, you know, and then you think about schools like Wisconsin and Iowa, you know, they primarily recruit this area of the country and, you know, they're in, in the upper Midwest and, you know, in the, in, in the plains, you know, farm country and dairy country up there in Wisconsin, you know, a lot of big boys up there that can play football and stuff like that. And I'm just, I've always thought like we could probably compete more with them on some of those recruits and stuff. Like, I mean, they get some four star kids in there and then, and then go after, find the elites that you get your base of linemen and then find the elites that you that really have Ohio state high and then full court press those kids. And, you know, try to get one or two high four star five star kids from around the country and get that three to four kids that are kind of in your backyard, you know, whether it's Ohio or the greater upper Midwest in general. But, you know, I, I just, sometimes I think that they're, you know, if all you're going to try to do is necessarily try to hit the South and South and South. And yeah, I mean, I know they've, you know, they get kids from out West and stuff too, but it just seems like, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of mouths trying to eat down in the South. And so, you know, it just seems like there's not as you're only competing against Notre Dame, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Iowa up here for the, you know, and Penn state yeah. to a point for, you know, big time college and Ohio state has to be a name for those kids. Like, I, I would think of a big time tackle out of the state of Wisconsin. Yeah, he might have always wanted to play for Wisconsin, but he might have never thought that playing for Ohio State was ever a chance. So, like, you know, you know, yeah, you, you might be able to go get him because we like you have a, you know, come play here, you have a chance to win a national title and uh, see where you end up, and you know you're going to be blocking for great quarterbacks. And and you know my stance has always been that the number one tackle and number one interior lineman in the state of Ohio most likely are not huge project people that, you know, unless mm -hmm. it's someone that's totally undersized like NPF, that you just couldn't get him on the field until his third year because you cannot get it big enough. You, I mean, you, you would imagine that those guys could be ready by their second year on campus that, and there is no reason Ohio State should not be locking down the number one tackle and the number one interior lineman in the state of Ohio every single year. Yeah, agreed. Um, so, yeah, so we'll see what happens with the. We'll see what happens if they end up hiring this fry um, and we'll see if they make any more changes on the, the defensive side. Um, I did want to say real quick about Knowles before we moved on, though, just. Because we saw during the Rose Bowl, Marcus Williamson started going off, you know, on Twitter, tweeting things about the team again. And I just think, you know, I, th there obviously there there was some lack of a voice in that defensive room this year. I mean, just from what we saw people do, guys leaving, you know, halfway through the year, leaving halfway through a game, <laughs> not going to the bowl game and starting shit about the team, you know, uh, on Twitter. I mean, we had two different players this year go off on Twitter mm -hmm. as and the game was, was going. One was as, at, as he left the game, he, he he left. He walked out off the field and he decided to go to Twitter and go after the team. So I I just think that you, you need someone to get some structure back into that room and not necessarily make everyone happy, but someone's got to be a tough voice for these guys and be like, hey, you know, you don't get everything in life handed to you that if yeah. you can't. You know, you keep keep fighting for it, but that's that's not the way to go. So hopefully we don't ever have to run into a season like that again where we have all that bullshit going on in the background. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to the Knowles era beginning. I'd like to see what because after the couple last couple of years, I mean, I know there's been some issues here and there with the running game and stuff at times. And, you know, but. With the offense that they've had, that they've rolled out there in 19, 20, and this year, that, you know, if they had a competent defense last year and a competent defense this year, you know, things might be a lot different. I don't know. I'm not saying that 
we beat Alabama last year in the national title. I mean, their offensive team is historic, um, but we definitely play a lot better of a game with them. And uh, we definitely have the horses, in my opinion, on offense that we could play with them. And if oh, we yeah. had a better defense and a better defensive thought process, who knows? We might beat them. And maybe, uh, maybe a better defense, even in 19 to a point that if you, you know, you lose one guy, and the Clemson game and, uh, you know, the whole middle of your field opens up. Maybe if they have a <clears throat> different, you know, even structure, who knows what even happens. And maybe you're more competitive. It, you beat Clemson and maybe you're even a more competitive team against LSU. So who well, knows what happens? And, and, you know, like you had to bring that up. Going back to that game, though, you know, we had a ton of success in that first half, first quarter especially. but first half running the ball. And I know a lot of it only amounted to field goals because, you know, we got stifled in the red zone, but come out in the second half and Venables switched a lot up on us and was giving us different looks, made it confusing for fields at times. And so, and that was something we didn't really see much with halfway. I mean, Wade got kicked out, you know, halfway through that game and they made it a two point or before halftime, they made it a two point game going into halftime. Like I would have loved to see them just like, make it a little bit more confusing for Trevor in that second half because they could have done that and won the game. So, and I think Knowles is the type of guy that he does do that. And I take nothing away from Jeff Halfley. He was a great yeah. coordinator, um, great teacher, but I just like watching the few times I watch Oklahoma state this year was they, they make it very hard after, you know, the first, after the first half for people to score again and just, I, I think it was like three or four games this year that, you know, teams didn't score in the second half or they only scored one time in the second half. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I mean, I know he wasn't the coach, but uh, you know, it's his influence was still there. And I watched most of that Notre Dame game and uh, they Notre Dame was. Couldn't move the ball at all in the second half, hardly. And uh, <laughs> the one touchdown or two touchdowns at the end. Of I think they only got the one touchdown. I think they got, and that was in the late in the fourth. That, and, that, and you, if you looked at that first half of that game and it was kind of like the Ohio state Utah game, like there's no way you could convince me that Notre Dame wasn't going to keep scoring in the second half of that game. Yeah. But they didn't. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. So players, we got some, you know, not only have we gotten some recruits, we've got two transfer players also in the last yeah. couple of weeks. So, um, Demonte, uh, like last... he goes by chip. That's to make it easy. He goes by chip. Uh, I think the Amante train him, right? Yeah. Played for Hoban was a running back. He went to Arizona state, uh, play running back. He's running. Well, um, and he's going to be playing linebacker, um, for the Buckeyes. So unlike steel, it'd be nice that they're going to get this guy in, in the rotation early, like get him. So hopefully by the time season rolls around, uh, he's ready to go. And, uh, you know, that could be uh, another big uh, defensive mark there. Uh, Tanner McAllister, uh, that's correct, right? McAllister. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he's the, he's transferred in from Oklahoma State. Uh, watched a bunch of his film over the last couple of days. Uh, I, I definitely like somebody that's going to understand Noel's defense, getting him into the room yeah, and a- that he's a grad kid. So it's not like just a freshman that is deciding to, uh, you know, hit the transfer portal. Uh, you know, he's, He's been in the system for four years and uh, or is it three years, three or four. I can't remember, but uh, four, but he has two years of eligibility because he has the covid year and maybe maybe a red shirt year in there. Yeah, I don't maybe, know. but he's Everything been in the system that covid year. Yeah, so he's been in the system for a while. So I definitely like that. Uh, somebody that can really teach the guys that, you know, because it's not just no, not not just a coach. Now you got a player, and you know they can actually watch him, and you know, watch Tanner do this, and now you do it. And, and let's, I mean, not not to throw too many people under the bus, but we did have a lot of struggles this year with uh, safety coverage, um, safety responsibilities, you know, assignments, and you know, linebackers in coverage too. And I'm sure he can. Being a safety, I'm sure he can help those guys out. Like, you know, be a voice for Jim Knowles also. Like, hey, this is where you're supposed to be. Yeah. And assist those linebackers. Because, like I like I mentioned in the first segment, there was uh, way too much covering grass this year. Yeah, and exactly. Not enough, covering, not enough covering bodies. And it was 
just horrible. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's a uh, nice, uh, and then we got three, uh, commits now. Uh, so, uh, um, the first one to drop was a bore, uh, you know, so we got him on uh defense of that. Uh, so that was a big get for them. Um, you know, he was, uh, he's one of the best defense linemen in the country. Um, you know, there was a part early on in the process where it seemed like he was, uh, I would say it didn't seem like Ohio. He, it, it seemed like he just had Ohio state on his list cause he had Ohio state on the list. And, uh, and then it was kind of like it seemed like over the second half of the season, and then it was seeming like they were really making headway with them. There was some crystal ball predictions that came out that he was, you know, Ohio State was the favorite, and you know, and then of course the Texas State championship game, he puts up the hook on. I'm like, man, they, okay, here's another NIL deal for Texas, and uh, so yeah, yes, he still hasn't signed yet. Uh, we still got a couple weeks probably to go until that is official, but. Uh, Hopefully we hold out on that one and uh, he is uh, ends up uh, fully signing on the thing. But and then um, Hinsman, uh, Heinzman, I can't remember. But uh, we beat Wisconsin on that. Uh, an For offensive, an, an in-state offensive lineman, man. And so, like I said earlier, you can you can go up there and you can fight them out. And there, I mean, you are Ohio State. I mean, you've been the premier team now for how long in this uh, conference? So, uh, you know. Their, their line coach leaving last it also week. doesn't hurt <laughs> that did not hurt but he made the decision the next day so to me that is i mean we lost our line coach and you know we haven't lost any of our commits so like you know to me yeah. that if he's good if if he's waiting to make the call the next day then it, to me that's like he's not sold on wisconsin which is the in-state school you know he wants to play for ohio state so like uh I mean, that was just my opinion reading between the lines. And then uh, Hero Canoe today, we got defensive tackle. Uh, so and he actually is already signed. So he signed today. Uh, we, he got during uh, the All-Star game. So And Boar was an All-Star game. He was the um, the All-American one. Or no, today was the All-American one. He was the Under Armour, right? He was the Under Armour game, yeah. Yeah, but so we got... Hero had previously, he already signed his letter of intent. He just kept it quiet. Okay. The other two are still hard commits because they can't sign until February. Okay. So, uh, all right. So that's uh, a good haul so far between transfer players and, uh, you know, recruits. Seems like uh, we're going to finish the class strong. Mm -hmm. Um, Larry Johnson's had a hell of a defensive line recruiting class the last two years. Uh, So, uh, yeah, I like to see what uh, now we unleash these boys under a new defensive system and, you know, it seems like Knowles does a lot of things on the defensive line, and it's been a while since they've really done a lot of different things. It seems like, you know, we just have better athletes than you, so we're going to get to the quarterback defense line. Now it seems like it's going to be more like we have better athletes than you, but we're going to do a lot of stunts, and we're going to line them up, up in different spots, and we're going to have them over different gaps, and we're going to shift them, and we're going to do all kinds of different cra- crazy things with them. And, uh, now they're better athletes, and there's going to be coaching scheming coming, uh, defensive scheming coming with them too. So it's going to make some things, I think, very interesting. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to watch some highlights from today's game and from the practices this week of uh, Cade and Curry because uh, Jeremy Birmingham swears that if that guy was from down south or a bigger high school football state than Indiana, he would be a five-star defensive end. Yeah, it seemed like a lot of people were mentioning him a lot. A lot, lot of people mentioned him, and... Uh, the nickname smaller bear as a comparison. And if you know, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I kind of want to watch that. See, uh, see how I feel about that. Yeah. And, uh, uh, it was like Kieran Graves or whatever. Is that how you, mm-hmm. he, I mean, he had a big game and he had some big practices this week. So you know, that, you know. that Brown from, you know, the quarterback we got late in the cycle, he had a good week. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, Looking, a lot of looking tough. I mean, we had a great class. I mean, and that's, I know everyone, like we missed out on those tackles and a lot of those offensive line targets that we had, but I think a lot of people like end of the day, didn't give Ohio state enough credit for how good that class was with only 18 people. And now that it's up to 21 or 22, I mean, it's like solid over 300 points and there is a ton of room between them and Texas. Like we are, yeah. 
we're not, you know, we're not going to jump. I think, what was it? It was Georgia. Uh, A&M had the best class ever. Crazy. And Alabama. So, I mean, there's there's no room to move up from fourth, but I don't think there's any chance that we can move down to fifth either at this point. Yeah. yeah. Great class. Ryan Day's only signed top five classes. Yep. So, I like that. We got some good recruits. Got some good uh, transfer kids. Uh, I definitely want, going forward, I think, uh, I know Day wants to, you know, make sure they're good fits and stuff like that. But uh, definitely use the transfer portal to your advantage, you know. You're going to have kids transferring out. We're seeing that now. You're going to lose kids, too, so you might as well gain kids. And I think the transfer portal is, these aren't, like, kids that just can't get on the field. Like, what you think about transfers in the past. You either thought about there was an issue with a kid and he had to sit out his year or it's a grad transfer and you know, it might be a good grad transfer, but with the transfer portal now, I think there's going to be a lot of going forward. There's going to be a lot of good kids and, you know, top level talent in that transfer portal. So, and you know, that's what makes recruiting good. You know, you might miss out a kid in recruiting and then a year or two down the road, uh, he might be in the transfer portal. And then, you know, those relationships you built during recruiting, you know, he's there. Yeah. All right, so season. You want to start off? Well, sure. Um, all right, my thoughts on the season. Obviously, I'm not happy how the season ended with Michigan. That was, uh, it's not easy losing to Michigan. Leo, you know, the 11 loss to Michigan was much more palatable because if it was. Uh, I've always said if it was the coach that was coaching them in 2010 or the coach that ended up coaching them in 2012 instead of Luke, which Luke's obvious. If if it was Luke today, <laughs> Luke would have won that game too. any of those situations. If it was any of those three, you know, Luke with experience, Jim Trestle or Urban Meyer, Michigan doesn't win that game in 2011. Um, it was Luke got thrown into a very crazy situation that he wasn't prepared for. Um, now in hindsight being 2020, I know probably some bad stuff were said about Luke back then, but I mean, I, I can't imagine you, and then you lose your, all your best players for pretty much the whole season on top right. of that, that, you know, you have Braxton as a freshman and he was explosive and all that stuff. Uh, but you know, he, you know, it would have been much different if prior is still there being sure. able to play. And, uh, prior, so prior makes up for a six point difference against Michigan. It would have been yeah. Michigan. Yeah. So it's just a different, it's just a different outcome of, you know, Posey and, uh, uh, Heron and, uh, Adams and, uh, those and, uh, prior all, you know, playing the whole season, you know, sure. but, uh, this year sucked a lot worse than that. This was a good Ohio state team that, you know, I think Oregon being a loss in the second week of the season, I think, you know, 2014 is still very fresh in everybody's mind. It's like, all right, you know, that was a young offense. This is a young offense and, um, you know, we'll bounce back. Mm -hmm. the, the loss is good for him. And for basically up to Michigan, the loss proved to be good for him that, you know, they were outside a couple of, you know, Nebraska and Penn state that were a little closer. I mean, they pretty much handled everybody on the schedule outside of that. And, you know, Michigan opened up a lot of people's eyes to maybe that there were some deficiencies there. And at the end of the day, so it sucks, but I think that uh, it probably is going to end up being a good thing because it refocuses them going into next year. And, uh, you know, I think Ryan Day got to learn that, you know, losing to Michigan, regardless of how good Michigan is or not good as Michigan is, that uh, it's bad taste in a lot of the fans mouths and people's you know around the program's mouth that they don't like it mm -hmm. and so he got to learn it i think that um he's gonna have a really focused uh team now going forward the great thing about having a really young team is most of these guys are back and uh so now they got to experience that bad taste too and now i think it's just gonna be a lot more than just mick getting after them in the winter it's gonna be them getting after it in the winter so yeah, I'm looking well, forward to that. And I've said that too. Like, I don't know if I said that on here, but you and I had talked about it. Like with just those guys calling them soft and the insults, like Desmond Howard threw at them that I don't know. 
I'm, I mean, I know Mick's going to be there. He's going to, you know, be tough on them. He's going to give them the training necessary, but I'm not surprised that one of their seniors aren't leading those workouts. You know, the, it, yeah. it's going to be very personal for them. Next. And we saw it in the Rose Bowl. That team could have very easily fallen apart, you know, with the way it was going in the first half. And uh, it takes a tough team to do what they did in the second half. Like, you know, you have to be mentally tough to try to come back from that. And they did. So, I think you that was gave him the the pep rally speech. Yeah. At Demario, Demario. McCall. Demario McCall could have been like those guys that didn't travel with the team, that walked off the field at halftime, quit, went to social media. No, he he was in the locker room. He didn't play in the Rose Bowl. Maybe special teams. I don't want to. Yeah, I don't, don't want to get get on Demario them, just because he got them fired up, man. It's just like, God, what a waste what they did with, I mean, I do blame that on coaching from Urban all the way up to day, but like you could have been his talent. Like you could not find a better place to put him anywhere on the field. Like the guy is a mismatch for how many people and like, you know, you could put him in the back. I mean, i saw that guy running between tackles. Like it was no problem. You could, you could put him in the backfield. You could put him as a receiver. You can move him all over the field and, you know, but um, sometimes that happens when you get loss of talent. And I'm, I think he was in the doghouse a lot. And his younger years, and uh, you know, never got out of it. Yeah, and then the um, offense just evolved to something that Brian Day doesn't run the same type of offense as Urban. Yeah, that's. I mean, because he he was perfect for Urban. I mean, that's. He's, I know he might not be Percy Harvin or Curtis Samuel, but he's in that mold. He could have, you know, been that tweener role that Urban loves so much, and but that's yeah. not. Day doesn't have that really in his offense. Yeah. So I definitely, uh, I definitely, I don't like where they ended up, but I, I think that it's probably going to be for the best for them moving forward. Yeah. And um, so looking forward to it, I would say if I had to grade the season, I'm going to give them a, I'm going to give them a B minus. Like, like, <laughs> I'm that's sorry. Funny. It's t- that's funny. Cause I was going to give a letter grade and I was going to say B minus <laughs> like, I, you know, you don't get a B for losing to Michigan. And, you know, I, part of me wants to give them a C, but, uh, like, I guess I'll be a little easier than that, that, uh, I think that, uh, you know, I don't like the fact they lost two games, but I like how they, they regroup themselves. Uh, you know, if they would have got blown out in the Rose bowl, I don't even know if I would C minus might've been lucky for me on that one. That, uh, that, that's, uh, that you at least got to come out with some sort of fire. And uh, so they regrouped themselves a lot in the the second half of that uh, Rose Bowl. That, because to me, that's a building point now for next year. So <clears throat> that's part of where that B-minus is coming from. Um, your thoughts, uh, and then we'll start moving to who we think were the players of the season and stuff. Uh, just your thoughts on the year altogether. Uh, well, I already said it was a B-minus also. So... Um, I've already talked touched on it. Offensive line, I think, was very poor. Run blocking against, you know, good competition. Better, com- or at least better competition. Bigger guys, you know, bigger, faster, stronger. The more elite competition that they had on the schedule or more senior competition. Um, so that needs improved. I was not, you know, I was not happy with that at all. It just, it felt like, it kind of felt like the Haskins year where they just, they don't know how to run block for the guy that can do, um, RPOs also when just kind of sucks because that's that's what Ohio State is um, going to the Michigan. I don't think they're soft, though, like the whole Michigan thing. And it sucks getting run over like that. But, you know, Nebraska didn't run over Ohio State. Penn State didn't run over Ohio State. Oregon, for the most part, it was all schematic nonsense that Ohio State didn't know what they were doing in their cover one one high safety look that they just were never at the boundary. <laughs> and, you know, they they <laughs> field open for Oregon to do whatever they wanted. So I don't think they're a soft team by any stretch of the imagination. I think that they were not well coached on defense. Um, I don't know what to tell you about the Michigan game. I mean, they did get run all over, but that was not indicative to, you know, the rest of the year. So I don't think, I don't think they're soft, but they definitely need a lot of help on defense. Um, Defensive line, you know, they, they, they didn't get sacks against better competition. That's something yeah. I'd love to see get improved again. I don't know if it's just some things have been become too simplistic because they think that 
they're just they got LJ and they're better than everyone else, but they got to start getting back to you know where <clears throat> the quarterback get pressure on the quarterback, make it uncomfortable for them. I mean, and people talk about they didn't get a sack against Michigan. They didn't make Michigan throw the damn ball in the second half. So I mean, what can I you know how how many times did Caden McNamara even have to throw the ball? I can't be that like. Well, for a team that didn't have to even see a third down, so I, I don't know how many times they really did have to. <laughs> right. I think they literally ran the ball 98% of the time in the second half. Did, I don't, did they even throw the ball once in the second half? No. Oh. I don't think they did. And, yeah, so I don't I don't know. I mean, Michigan's not that good of a running team. And I'm sorry, I know that that was what they were the best at, but, I mean, we saw it against even Iowa and against Georgia. They're not a great running team. They're just, they are what we thought they were, and Ohio State just came up short. They played really, really bad in that game. Um, Yeah, so, I mean, it's offensively, though, you know, when times were tough, C.J. Stroud took a lot of grief, especially early in the year, but his play was the only thing that kept Oregon and Michigan close. (laughs) Their run game wasn't working in those games. His play and his play was really the thing that kept them in that Utah game until they really figured them out. So anyone that wants to, you know, be hard on C.J. Stroud for the year, just go back and actually look at those games. If it wasn't for him, I mean, those could have been easily Iowa's and Purdue's and Clemson's that, you know, you lost by four plus scores. And they didn't in any of those games, even if Michigan felt like they lost by 50 points, they lost by, you know, 15. So. It, and it was him that kept them in those games. So I, I'm not going to, you know, I can't crap on him at all. He had a great season. Um, offense was great, but again, got to improve the run, got to improve the red zone. Yeah. Red zone offensive strategy needs to be improved. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to next year, though. Like you said, though, Knowles um, coming in, I think he's going to do wonders for the defense. A fresh face, fresh idea, young voice on the offensive line. I think that's going to be great for them, too. So very excited for next year. I think, you know, as long as the defense gives them any sort of competent play, that that they'll be in the national title picture again next year. I don't know if they'll win it because, you know, they got a lot of a lot of youth on defense, especially with a new system, but a lot of good youth, as we saw this year. That was a very, you know, that was a bright spot. Tyleek Williams, uh, JT. Um, Sawyer. Jack you know. Sawyer. You know, that's a lot of good things that we saw. Eichenberg at the end of the day. Yeah. making Court Williams when he got in there, making plays. Denzel Burke, for crying out loud. I mean, he was a true freshman. He was the lowest rated of the cornerbacks that we brought in. And the guy was a lockdown corner for the yeah. most of the, I mean, I know he had a I bad mean, you can only imagine what he imagine though what he's going to be like next year i mean cam brown's coming back so i mean they got a lot of young talent that got a lot of experience this year and then you got a lot of young talent coming in next year for linebackers so yeah i think that um there's one thing i'm the one thing i'm really looking forward to is kind of like i think over the last you're right over the last couple of years they've gotten really lazy on the defense that i think it's that you know larry is the best coach in the game he teaches them well and stuff like that but you didn't have necessarily have a generational talent like maybe uh you know chase and uh you know the bosa brother so you know you, you had to maybe give the defensive line a little bit more help and i think with Knowles, you're going to get that that even if he has generational talents on the defensive line i think he's going to be okay throwing a blitz more blitzes at teams and you know bringing the linebackers a little bit more and he's going to mix up coverages and different things so i think in the other two layers of the defense they're going to do a lot more schematic things that are going to maybe confuse a quarterback for that split second longer they let a defensive end get home or you know whatever and that's the thing mike how many sacks are we talking about tyreek smith having throughout his career if a quarterback just had to think another half a second no how close did that guy get so many times? And I know he got held a ton at the beginning of his pursuit, so he still almost got to the quarterback. But how many sacks does Tyreek Smith have as a Buckeye? You know, even Zach Harrison. That you know, yeah, we don't know because they just couldn't get there quick enough. And if they, if there was something else, if the linebackers were in some sort of you know man coverage within their zone instead of just covering grass, that was an easy drop off for quarterbacks. Or, you know, safeties did better in coverage, whatever, maybe may confuse the quarterback a little bit. Don't be so predictable. Give them a different look, you know, pre-snap to post-snap. 
yeah. they could they could have done wonders for those guys because you didn't have a Chase Young that could get <clears throat> home in a second. Just you, you know, you you don't have a Bosa or a Young, so you need to help those guys out a little bit more than what they did. Yeah. Um. All right. Who's your uh, Who's your uh, offensive defensive MVPs of the season? Offensive MVP, I think it's a no-brainer. It has to be C.J. Stroud. I mean, I agree, and that's who I'm going to go with, so I'm going to just throw <laughs> and, it up. And when, by saying that, though, because you know the weapons on that offense, is fourth place for Heisman, was that a robbery? Yeah, because he showed in the DM Rose Bowl that uh, – he has his two best receivers supposedly sitting out, uh, you know, JS said, yes, 300 something yards and like ungodly, but Marvin Harrison jr. Looked really good. A looked really good. Fleming got in on the action. You know, he, the dude can throw the ball around and, you know, I think he's, what well, are they going to make excuses next year that when these receivers are having another good season that, well, it's just the talent around him. Like, come on, give me a break here. Like, you know, yeah. how's, how's Bryce young, the winner. And that's not talent around him to like, what's right. the difference here? Like, and I'll take Bryce young winning it. I mean, I still think Stroud I'm fine should, with that, but Stroud should, have Stroud should have, should have won the award, but I'll take Bryce young winning it. But there is no way he should not have been at least second. Like yeah. Aiden Hutchinson for one game. And it was a hell of a game. Don't get me wrong. He had a hell of a game against Ohio State. Him being second in the Heisman was a freaking joke though. Yeah. Um, yeah. defense, defensive guy. Defense was not a bright spot this year. <laughs> so I don't. Is Jim Knowles is Jim Knowles the just because he gets to come and he's <laughs> that got us to Knowles in this bad defense. I guess. I mean, can I give one to each position? Just because I, I I don't think anyone really stood apart. So, um, I'd give Haskell Garrett for defensive line. He led the team in sacks. He had a solid year. I mean, I think he was banged up a lot, though. And, you know, he wasn't he did get pushed around, I think, a little bit against Michigan. But I think he was also banged up in that game. Um, Steel Chambers was a pleasant surprise at linebacker. So I would give him for that group. And then for secondary it has to be for me, Denzel Burke. And I know Cam Brown had a very solid year, yeah. but Burke was like an eraser out there, man. So that was. And that's who that's actually who my MVP was going to be is Burke, um, just because as a freshman, as good as he played. And I, I know some people want to nitpick a little bit on the Michigan game, but you know, I don't know how good he would have been in the second half. Nobody forced him to throw the ball, <laughs> like he didn't right. throw the force him to throw the ball. So, um, you don't, you don't force Cade McNamara to throw on you. Great. You still got two seasons left of this kid. And, uh, like that's what he looked like his freshman season. Like we're going to Burke Island here over the next two years. And like, he's just going to be just, you might not even hear his name get called in the game because like quarterbacks are not going to challenge him because he's just going to be that on. I mean, he was that on. I mean, he was even when the best receiver he played the season was bell at Michigan or at uh, Purdue. And, you know, he had a couple of good catches, but he also had a couple, he was with him every time. And uh, so like, yeah. Yeah, I, I think mean, he's... Bell didn't do anything easy against Denzel Burke. I mean, and the same thing with Jahan Dotson. Like, neither one of them did anything easy against Denzel Burke. They had to move him around a ton. They had to go against yeah. other guys. I mean, let's face it. Bell had a ton of catches for, like, 100 yards. I mean, that was it's just, it was all short stuff. It wasn't, like, he didn't beat Burke at all. Yeah. All right. I think uh, unless you have anything else you want to hit, I think we're going to call that one a night. Uh, nope. I'm good, man. Like I said, right. Bam is going to win. So don't yeah, even, I think, don't even I think so too. <laughs> yep. I think so too. Does Nick, all ride right. Off the sunset. What is it? Does Nick ride off into the sunset or does he still have a few more left? When I, I, until I saw him in that bomber jacket today, I'm just like, I'm like Nick's coaching for the next 10 years, man. <laughs> Probably yeah. gonna ride a B B twenty nine into the stadium tomorrow night. <laughs> mm-hmm. For sure, man. Um, all right. So let's get on out of here then. Thank you everyone for stopping in tonight to the Buckeye Bar. I'm John. And I'm Mike. O H I O. Thank you for tuning in to this week's Buckeye Bar, guys, on Buckeye Bar Talk. 
Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Hit that all notifications bell so you see when new content is added. And please remember to like and share so we can grow our audience. Uh, don't be afraid to comment. We want to know what you're thinking and we want to know what content to add for you guys. O-H-I-O.